good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you might be joining us from, whatever time zone. We're delighted to have you for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited today because we have one of our favorites back on, Jack Alato Ignacio Nacho, and he is also the birthday boy. Yes, that's right. It is. Today is my birthday. Awesome. Well, we got you. I don't know if you can see the screen, but we I got can. a special birthday crown that nice. we get, you get to wear. And so we are so excited to have you back on. I was telling my team, I was like, oh my God, I, I haven't spent any time with you. So I'm really excited wow. to be able to do this. So yeah, I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm getting ready to take a trip to Arizona just to have lunch with you. <laughs> Well, yeah, do it. Do it while the weather's good, man. This, nice, is the yeah. time. this is the time. Well, hey, everybody, we are here because we have amazing partners like Jack Delato from Fundraising Academy at National University. But our sponsors also include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These are the folks that really come with us day in and day out. We have surpassed our 900th episode. We're marching towards 1,000 shows, which will happen around the first of the year. And you can find those all on, as I like to call them, our sexy new app. Um, you could get us through streaming broadcasts and certainly podcasts. Wherever you consume your content, we're going to be with you and we're going to be there to help support your organization. Okay, Jack, we have so many questions and I love this question I held it back because I wanted you to answer it. Um, and I might float it to some other of your uh, members of your team. But this is fascinating. And I did take their name off because I didn't want it to be identifiable. But it comes to us from Los Angeles. And the question is, I have a new donor added to my portfolio that I just met with. Honestly, I'm not sure if we're a good fit. The vibe is not there. Should I try to get another development officer to take them into their portfolio? Really good question. It's a, it's a great question. And, you know, yeah. it gives me the opportunity to talk about one of the most beautiful and elegant tools that we have at the Fundraising Academy. And maybe this bad vibe is the result of having different social styles. Everybody has a different social style. Maybe the donor... Uh, or the prospect has an analytical social style where they just want facts, figures. They want you to pro progress in a logical order towards talking to them about your cause. And maybe your style is more of a um, amicable person. You are more touchy-feely. You want to get to know the person better, but they just want the facts and figures. So before you push that person on or that uh, prospect to another development professional, try to figure out their social style, and then try to figure out your social style. Guess what? You could do that free of charge by going to mylearningportal.org at the Fundraising Academy and watching our webinars on social style. One of the best webinars, and I looked at it this morning that we have there, is on being flexible with your social style. Flexing, being able to determine your donors, our prospects, social style, and flexing to communicate with them. Here's the thing about social styles. It's all about communication. If your donor just wants the facts, then that's the way you're going to communicate with them. So this, before you ask another person to do it, be versatile with it, with your social style. Figure out theirs, figure out yours and then try to communicate with them in their social style, the way they want to be communicated with. You know, I I didn't think that that's at all what you were going to say. So I love that. I also think, and, and tell me what, you, what your sense of this is, Jack, because I feel like this is not going to be the only time this happens for Name yeah. Withheld. And so maybe it is really important to, to do what you're saying, take that step back, be a little bit more reflective about what those social styles are, because um, ultimately you could do the pass off and it might not work for somebody else, right? That's right. Yeah. So oh, that could happen. 
You know, early in my career, I remember uh, my my supervisor, who I learned so much from her. Um, she and I were touring through a facility that where I was working, and she, I could tell that she was not getting along with the donor. They just were not communicating. And I remember after the meeting, she turned to me, my boss turned to me and said, from now on, you're going to deal with their not. Yeah. So maybe it was just a communication clash. And now we have some tools, especially in our cost selling cycle, where you could get some tools to help you deal with that. Yeah, I love that. And I think too, you know, Jack, with so many people having been working from home or in smaller groups, we're probably all a bit rusty on this yeah. social aspect. So maybe this is just a great thing to be investing in, in terms of, you know, time and energy and, and, and looking at your own mind and saying, where do I fit and how can I work through this? Because, yeah. you know, as we start to, you know, convene more in person, um, I can see there's going to be some social duress. Yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Really interesting. Okay, good. Well, I hope that helps name with health. Let's go to, um, <clears throat> pardon me, Sean from Henderson, Nevada. Now, this is another one that I thought of you when this question came in. Sean writes, I'm setting my goals for 2024. How critical is it for my career and income to have the CFRE accreditation? I am not sure if this is worth my personal and financial investment. Please advise. So why did I think of you when I saw this question? Yeah. Uh, so, well, because, you know, I am a big proponent of CFRE. I had five study groups this past year. And we did one thing. Julia, that I am so proud of. We had a study group specifically for marginalized communities of color. Wow. Yeah. And we had 40 people in that. And here's the thing about it. Typically, I'm the instructor. Mm -hmm. I didn't instruct. I found six fabulous people of color to lead a study group of people of color. Next year, in fact, I just got confirmation we're going to do two additional study groups other than the ones that we normally do. One is going to be for Muslim professional developments, uh, development professionals. Awesome. And the second one is going to be for Latinx uh, communities. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to grow our community and definitely have more diversity and access, which is really important to me. But here's the thing about the FRA. So when you achieve the CFRE, you demonstrate that you have a certain degree of fundraising knowledge, which is really important. And I look at CFRE as an ethical assurance that you are going to follow ethical practices, not only to your donors, but also to the leadership. You know, I looked yesterday at um, a previous uh, webinar I did, and it was based on the responses of current CFREs to, to three important things. Here's what the CFREs say. 89% of current CFREs say they have enhanced professional opportunities. That's key. That's a reason to do it. In fact, I talked to someone yesterday who was in a study group. He achieved a CFRE, lives in Ohio. He said that the offers for jobs are coming in. That's what that 89% says. 92% of CFREs said that since they've gotten that certificate, they have more confidence in their ability to do it. One of the most incredible things that happened to me this year was a woman sent me an email and she said in that email, I have achieved the CFRE. And I want to tell you, Jack, I've gotten rid of a lot of my imposter syndrome as a result, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> Women, people of color have this imposter syndrome, some men as well, mm -hmm. um, you know, and she was able to get rid of some of that. The third statistic I will tell you about, 93% of CFRE say they would highly recommend it to their colleagues, their uh, the people that they work with in their institution that they should also see mm -hmm. the CFRE. I think those, those three statistics mm -hmm. tell it all. 
So, Jack, can you really quickly before we move on, and I realize you, you're not, you know, you're not an employee of the organization and all that, but what's a realistic, like, cost and time investment? Like, yeah. how long is this journey going to take? Right. Because I know a lot of people who've taken that test many, many yeah. times and have not been able to pass it. Yeah. And, you know, my whole big thing is I believe in the power of yet. They just haven't passed it yet, yeah. but they could pass it. <laughs> I think, you know, as far as money, I, I mean, I <laughs> recommend three books and you could get all of those used. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key books is to get the CFRE study guide. It's the only book they publish. It's about 45 bucks, 50 bucks. You get these used. I think it takes 80 hours of study. Okay. Um, in your home state, I talked to a guy last year who had been in the prison system in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And he got out of the prison system and he decided he was going to dedicate his life to working with the prison system around faith-based initiatives. He got his CFRE. And I talked to him on the phone and I said, how long do you think it took? And he said it took him 80 hours of study. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. He okay. knew how much time it would, would take. The cost you know, to certify and take the test probably about a thousand. I'm going to guess at that. Don't hold me to it, but you could go to their website and check out what they say there. As, and of course, anyone could reach out to me. I'm happy to chat about it. I'm one of their ambassadors. Yeah. So, uh, well, you know, out. you're an evangelist for sure. And I, I know that um, it's, it's really an important thing. We have a viewer that just wrote in, I spent about five months studying. Three of those were very in depth. So thank you for, for, yeah. jumping in on that because um again i think you're not just learning for a test you're learning for your career and your profession and so right you know pulling this all together so that's a great thing and, and, and that viewer that viewer i congratulate him or her wow what commitment determination yeah. isn't that a beautiful thing in that viewer yeah. determination yeah. focus and a goal setting to achieve something i love it yeah. They're going to be I successful think... in their life, whoever that is. <laughs> that's cool. Thank you. I think you, I, that's, that's great. I'm glad that, uh, that you said that. And I think that's like really powerful and, and a good opportunity. You know, I think on the nonprofit show, we, we're all about elevating our sector, making us, um, you know, more professional, getting, earning more money, getting more respect organize organizing ourselves um so that we can be more competitive in the for-profit and for the nonprofit sector too so i'm all about however we can navigate ourselves towards better things right and you and do so that five days a week julia you and jared <laughs> I, I have to applaud you and i'm gonna say to my to my friends at the fundraising academy they do it all the time too yeah and it becomes a mindset and i think that's what the cfre thing um really helps you achieve too um, with that. Okay, well, let's go to our next question. You, I knew you would be like the perfect person to ask that of Jack, but Roland and Stephanie from Tampa, Florida write in, we are thinking about setting up a board training or onboarding for new board members. Would it be a good idea to do this with a few other nonprofits in our area or should this be done only with our own nonprofit? We're trying to be efficient and cheap. <laughs> I love, I, I love that. I, I don't call it cheap. I call it cost effective. Here's the oh. thing about this. I think that uh, joint board trainings are effective to a point. Mm -hmm. And let, let's, let's think about some of the topics that would work for an organization that's a ballet company and an organization that's a social service organization. Yeah. So, so here's here's to the point where it would be a good to get them together. Well, first of all, they'll they'll form a cohort. They'll get you know there'd be some bonding. All of the legal stuff will be the same for the state of Arizona or California. All of the federal stuff will be the same. The role of the board as stewards of mission will be the same. The role of the board as stewards of finances, policy creation, all of those things will be the same. Mm -hmm. Then I would say separate them and do specific trainings on your programs. The programs of a ballet company, they should train their board members specifically on that. A homeless shelter on homelessness, the statistics, the need, et cetera. 
So yeah. one size in that way doesn't fit all. Mm-hmm. Board tenure, gift acceptance policies, they may be different. The ballet company may accept planned gifts. The, the social service agency may not. Mm-hmm. So it, it wouldn't be a good thing to put them together. Mm-hmm. But on lots of things, legal things, state, federal laws, et cetera, mm-hmm. the IRS, and in Canada, you know, the uh, Taxing Authority of Canada, all of those things would be important. Yeah. You know, I think it's, I, I like your approach where you, you know, maybe do a general onboarding uh, for folks in the nonprofit sector and then doing that next piece, which would be a breakout for those individual groups, because undoubtedly they're going to be internal issues that are different. But right. yeah, I mean, I think that when we do our board trainings, um, one, I'm always astonished by how much board members don't know in terms of just the basic compliance issues and how there's a fiduciary issue here and a a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe to kind of pull that aside and make that more um, community focused, if you will, that it's not just the ballet or the zoo or the temple or the church, right? It's, it's like literally something that is a standardized issue. And then moving aside to, um, what that individual organization does. I think it's really, really a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like, I like that approach. I think that's, that's smart. Well, I hope Roland and Stephanie, um, that this helps. And, and I do follow Jack's word. Don't be cheap, be cost effective. <laughs> that always sounds better. Okay. Right. Let's go on to Anna from New Orleans. <clears throat> Pardon me. What do you think about starting up a junior or young professionals board? We're kicking around the idea and it seems like it'll take a lot of work on our staff's part. Any ideas on how to make this more successful if we do it? Yeah. So I I think the first question that has to be answered is what are your goals? Yeah. What do you want to do? A lot of organizations say, hey, you know, we need more young professionals involved in our organization. Fine. I get that. Every organization that's, you know, prospecting, bringing in younger people is really important. Um, But when you set up a junior board, so to speak, you have to have, and it will take a lot of work. Some Mm -hmm. organizations say, hey, we're going to set up this junior board. They recruit, they get people, and then they have no idea what they're going to do. It just sits right. And they just sit, sit there. I guess thing that, uh, so aside from having goals, I think that you have to plan what are the benefits to the members? Mm -hmm. What membership benefits are you going to give to this junior board? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits and what are you going to ask them to do? Right, right. So, I mean, answer those questions first. And then if you, if you have, you know, a really set goal, then I would say go for it. Yeah. And, you know, since today is my birthday and I'm getting older, I wish I could go backwards. I want to be careful about ageism. You know, yeah. we don't want to look like we're ageist because we think they're going to bring something different than those uh, 50 and 60 year olds on the board now. So be careful with that, too, guys. <laughs> I know, you know, I just uh, I've been in Maui for the week and I was uh, working with the Credit Union Executive Society, which is kind of like the professional governing body of credit unions, which are nonprofits. And um, I was brought over to to work with them and their members on um, attracting, cultivating, retaining next gen talent. And it was so interesting because the average um, board member in that in that world is pushing 80 years old. And so they were like looking at me as a 61 year old thinking that I was next gen. And I was like, yeah, no, (laughs) it's, you know, um, and it was so fascinating to uh, work with them and, and kind of help them to understand who's coming up, how they work and, and, and why it's different. I'm a big a proponent of young professional boards. I don't think they should be called junior boards. I think they should be young professional boards. Um, I also think that you can uh, underwrite this. I think there's so many large organizations who look to 
the value of board service is a training piece and marketing piece. Yeah. Um, I don't know why you couldn't do this, but yeah, you're going to have to, you're going to have to so have somebody from your team yeah. navigate this and manage it because it's yeah. not going to, this is the whole thing. It's, it's a platform for training. And right. engage, yeah. How about it? That? Julia, how about if you're on the original board and your staff comes and you say, hey, guess what? We're going to form this new junior board of young professionals. What? How is that going to make your other board members feel? What? Oh, a new and improved board is coming to save the organization. <laughs> Old and tired, it's got to go, you know? So I would be careful of those kinds of things. Yeah, I think it's true. And I also think that it's a... It's a way, I loved how, what you started and that is, you know, advising Anna to say, what are your goals? Like, why are you even trying to do this? Is this just like a buzzworthy thing that you're going to explore? Or do you see something specific that you can, you know, put into place and manage yeah. it and measure it and yeah. then determine if it's working? And there are other ways to involve young people. I knew a ballet company that used to do ice cream social for younger uh, professionals after work or go mm -hmm. into their workplace and do, a, you know, like ice cream mm -hmm. giveaway or something like that to get them involved in the nonprofit. And those things were very effective. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. I think that's really, really cool. Well, um, let's do, we only really have time for one more question. And so let's um, get that uh, dealt with. Judy from Portland, Oregon writes in, we have professional dollars to spend in Q1 of 2024. And I think we should have someone come in and talk about fundraising to our whole team, including programming. I'm getting some resistance to this idea. This is a fascinating question. Help me sell this to our leadership. We all need to know how to fundraise. Yeah. Well, Very well, interesting. You know, I, I love this question and <laughs> I love this person from Portland, Oregon, because what she's trying to do is create a culture of philanthropy mm -hmm. where everyone in the organization, program staff, board, other staff, everyone understands the importance of yeah. fundraising. And so kudos to her <laughs> a, a first. And then secondly, I think that we have to understand that money fuels mission. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. what keeps our organization advancing that mission and doing that. Yeah. So yes, I urge her to go to that, the leadership and talk about a culture of philanthropy mm -hmm. and how that culture of philanthropy will bring mm -hmm. in more financial resources to the organization and mm -hmm. how that will really advance their mission even further than where they are now. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I love that you phrased it that way, because after listening to you, I realized there's a bigger issue with this organization. If they're not even thinking that, that they don't celebrate or um, perpetuate or even steward a culture of philanthropy, this is kind of like a pretty big picture. It's not just for those people in that room over there, right? right. <laughs> it's everybody. And I think I think that's an important thing. So yeah, yeah, Judy, good luck with that. I mean, um, it's it's wow, it's it's bigger than just an event in Q1 of next yeah. year. And you know, Julia, I don't know in your career, but in my career, some of the biggest gifts I ever received were because program staff understood the culture yeah. of philanthropy and they talked to donors. Mm -hmm. Physicians would talk to transformational donors yeah. about the importance of the work they would do or social workers, whatever. So yeah, yeah. get them on board. Yeah. I, I absolutely think that, um, you know, I've never been a professional fundraiser, but I've certainly been a fundraiser throughout my community as two, two additional generations back. And now my child moving forward is a, is an additional generation. And um, when you can communicate the passion and the need and the commitment to why we all need to be a part of this, that's magical. And so you can't just, I, I think, and it's not sustainable if you're just like, write me a check and then I'll write you one next time you ask me. I mean, it's got to be deeper than that. I mean, that's what Fundraising Academy has really yeah. enlightened me about is that that whole concept of, you know, relationships and relationship management and, and why and how we do things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very profound. And, and I agree with you. I don't think that it's just 
something that is for the development team. Right. You know, it's not, it's, it's, um, <clears throat> you're going to be hog tying yourself if it's just the development team. Right. Yeah. And, and, and fails at uh, fundraising yeah. fails happen when it's just the development team, Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it, it's too much. Yeah. It's too much. Okay. It's a team sport, right? <laughs> it's a team sport. <laughs> it's a team sport. I love it. Well, happy birthday to Thank you. Jack, Ignacio, Nacho, a lot of. Thank you so much. I love you. And I'm, I'm so happy to see you today. It's beyond belief. I'm over the moon. Well, me too. Me too. I, it's been a lot of fun. I always love your wisdom and your joy that you serve with and how you educate us. And um, so I hope you get to have a fabulous birthday. You should have some nachos. I will. With that birthday. I'm just saying with birthday cake, because, you know, Nacho Alato has to have nachos for his birthday. I'm just Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm just saying, hey, you know, check out fundraising-academy.org. Um, and, and really, they have such amazing programming, free programming, thoughtful programming, team building programming. Um, they, they're they adding to their content all the time. So this is not stale stuff. This is stuff that's really navigating a changing society, a changing workforce, and a changing nonprofit sector. And so um, really amazing information that will help any organization, whether you're in the fundraising part of your organization or not. I mean, just in general, the nonprofit sector, I think there's magical things going on there. Um, Jack, we're going to be announcing pretty soon about your uh, Fundraising Academy next big event coming in the spring, um, Cultivate, which is going to be fun. Yeah. And so we'll be talking about that as well. And I, and think I will be there this year. Cool. So. Yeah, happy it's on my birthday. calendar. And somebody wrote in, happy birthday, Jack. We love and appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. Hey, everybody, <laughs> we have, speaking of awesome, we have awesome supporters here at the Nonprofit Show. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, where Jack comes to us from, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech tech talk these are the folks that are with us day in and day out um on special birthdays like today for jack Alato and every day so we have a lot of cool things coming up going towards the end of the year and in the new year um we're we're booking out we're already almost booked out with guests um through the through the first of the year and or into February. And uh, we have some really interesting guests and every day, Jack, as you know, it's a different day and, and something right. fun to mm -hmm. learn. So as we like to end every episode of the nonprofit show, especially on a birthday date, like today with Jack Alato, we want to send this message along to everyone and it is to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jack.